let's um, uh, get to hacking. The first thing I want to bring up is just the OAuth webpage. So if you go to um, zaproxy.org, what you'll find here is their web their web page, and you can uh, download that from here. So if you go to the download page, you'll have different installers for different operating systems. Um, it does work as a jar file, so it's is it they do a platform version, or you can also download like a custom version. So the current version is 2.90. Um, they average about two full releases a year, uh, but they do do weekly releases uh, that you can build yourself. Um, what they have been doing is they've been moving a lot of the functionality out of the core product into add-ons, which I'm going to show you uh, later on. Um, and that's where they're doing a lot of their updating more, more frequently and, and how they're able to, um, to iterate. Uh, they also have a Docker instance. It's a live release, and basically it's, it's built every time that there's any changes to the repo. Um, it One note is that it's uh, internationalized and localized, so it, it, the application itself has been translated into over 30 languages. Um, their claim is that they're the, the world's most widely used web scanner, and, and nobody has refuted that claim. Just a couple of metrics is that for March 2020, they were Zap was actually downloaded more than eighty five thousand times. Uh, Docker images were pulled more than two hundred twenty thousand times, and the Zap application itself was started more than one million times. So I also want to go into the chat and uh, um, and if you go to their help, and if you go to also yeah, if you go to OWASP dash do shop dot juice dot shop um, that'll bring up this same page, and you can do this so you can so you can. Uh, from sources, uh, they have several package distributions, uh, container, which is probably the um, the most common. And you can actually push it uh, exactly to Roku for free. Um, and so, the, you know, in several different ways to, to get uh, this function up and running. I'll just show quickly, and we're going to come back to this, is that the um, OWASP Zap um, organization repo, which has all you know the source code for the proxy itself, extensions, and you know certain of the other add-ons that, that they have as part of the core product. So with that, we'll go ahead and start up Zap. Hey, Caleb. <clears throat> yep. Sure. Your uh, your audio is cutting a little in and out again, if you want to give it a minute to catch back up to you. OK. That that sounded better. OK, great. So I'm loading up Zap now. When Zap loads for the for the first time, it's going to ask you if you want to persist the session. Um, so if, if you plan on coming back to this, or you're doing maybe uh, you know a long range uh, assessment, then you want to persist the session, and you can save it, and then you know all your results and your progress are all saved, and you can come back to it at a different time. So just for this demo, I'm going to not persist my session. So is anyone familiar with proxies? Has anybody used a proxy before? Okay, so a proxy, it sits between the web browser and the application and all traffic um, that comes through your web browser is actually getting uh, captured here. So you can see that the traffic is coming in, you know, just when you start Firefox, and you're going to see all the traffic here, and you can actually modify that on the fly. Um, so how you set this up manually, I'm also going to show that there's an automated method uh, built in this app. Um, but I prefer Firefox because it doesn't use the, the system settings. Um, 
if, if you use Chrome or the, uh, the other uh, browsers, you usually have to use the system um, proxy settings. But Firefox has their own settings, so you don't have to worry about any other traffic being proxied, just the traffic that, that you care about. Um, so if you go down to connection settings, and then you can enter in your proxy and whatever port that's listening on. Um, Zap, by default, listens on port 8080, um, but, I, but I do have another application running, so, um, uh, so I I'm running on a different port. So once you set that up, one thing you do have to do is you have to, um, to be able to test HTTPS sites, is you actually have to install the root certificate for Zap. So um, we'll go ahead and do that quickly is if you go down to tools and options and then a dynamic SSL search and you can regenerate them. And then if you wanna save them, let's save to our downloads. Well, that's not seem to be working, but if <laughs> it's probably something with, with um, we'll try to save it and see if it's saved there. But you save that, and then when you go back into Firefox, privacy and security, and view certificates, and then you want to import that certificate that you um, that you saved and, and it didn't work. But so you, and you didn't put that in and then that would allow you to proxy traffic. But what actually, one nice thing with Zap is they have the ability that you can actually open a browser uh, on your own. And then if you click this button here, it'll actually already do all that cert um, information. It'll also already make sure that, uh, that, that Zap is proxying correctly. So with that, we can just go down a little bit um, of an overview of Zap. So you have the top menu here, which, and you have you know your your options at the top, which are going to be very similar and match to a lot of the options down here on the top level toolbar. So you you first you have your modes. Um, so you have safe, which means no dangerous uh, operations are permitted, um, and then you have protected, which only dangerous operations of URLs and scope. It's your standard basically allows you to do anything, scan or spider in a URL. So you can select a URL, any URLs to uh, spider or select. Uh, and then you have the attack mode, which basically means that as you're browsing that application, it's actually going to start um, actively scanning it kind of on the fly. So we'll go ahead and stay in protected mode. Um, and then the, these here, you know, are all about, you know, opening and, and saving your persisted session. Um, one thing about Zap is, is it's really um, a Swiss Army knife of features. So there's a lot of things you can do to change the UI uh, to your liking. So for me personally, is I like the um, the extended information tab, but you can change these uh, depending on how you like the information being displayed to you, um, and depending if you have a, a preference or if you've worked with a different proxy in the past. So up here at the top, you're going to see this window here, and this gives you um, to allow, this is a, your worker pane window, so it allows you to do any automated scanning. So you can, you know, if you wanted to start right away, you could, you know, select your URL in here, and it would actually start doing um, an automated scan. You also have your manual explorer, and that would, if you when you put a URL in here, it would launch your browser for you with that URL, and, and we'll explore that in a second. And then you all, then you also have um, just your help here. And one thing is too, like to change your browser that you that you uh, want to launch is you actually can change it in here, and then you can change which browser that you prefer, and you'll see that the that your icon will change to whichever browser you prefer. Um, down here at the bottom is is all your traffic that you're going to be seeing, and then you have some uh, tabs here at the top that'll actually show you what that request looks like and, and what that response is. Here's your sites menu here. So you see these are all the sites that um, different hosts that, that it actually has um, any traffic that is sent from your browser. 
and we'll, we'll go ahead and and go to one vulnerable application. And then we can kind of show you some of how that traffic flows through. Does anybody have any question or, or hopefully my audio isn't too choppy? The uh, the audio has been a lot better. I've, I've been following along. I had to make sure that everything was downloaded on Zap. Awesome, thank you. So let's go ahead and we'll actually go this in, let's go ahead and put this in standard mode and we'll actually do a quick start. And we're gonna say we're gonna manually explore a URL. So I, I did mention that um, I do really prefer uh, the Juice Shop. However, Juice Shop is um, a very modern application, which will really, you know, more or less uh, be a very challenging application to do security testing on. So I'm gonna choose a, a slightly easier target for the, for the sake of demos. And this is called the Budget Store. Um, and you can run this also as a, um, as a Docker instance. So once you hit this long browser button, um, it's actually going to uh, pop up Firefox and we'll go ahead and do the proxy and the um, and other certificates for you. load up here. So one thing I do want to pause and, and talk about that is, is so unique to Zap is something called the, um, the heads up display. So what you have here is when you launch that and you select this button to en enable the HUD. Um, and when you launch for the first time, it'll actually pop up a tutorial. So you'll kind of know how to, how to work with it. But it actually gives you this heads up display in the browser itself of what the application is doing. So um, it, and it, it basically is a snapshot of, of a lot of the features that you have in the application itself, but you don't have, you can actually focus on the application itself um, instead of swooping back and forth between Zap and the application. So we'll kind of, I'm gonna, I'm gonna minimize it for now, but then we'll go, we'll go through it in detail. So, we'll, so the first thing you wanna do is when you're going to do any security testing of the application is you wanna put this in scope. So Zap calls these scopes um, context. So what you wanna do is, you do this a couple of different ways. You can do it manually entered in, or if you um, if you want to, you can actually do this. You can right click on the site tree and go include in context. And then I'm going to hide everything, um, and and uh, and then I'll, I'll we can go through the site tree a little bit. So what you have here is you say I want to include this in the context. Basically, this means this is in scope for security testing. Um, one thing I, I should uh, disclaim is that you know you want to make sure that you're only testing anything you're legally allowed to test. Um, so this is where this this becomes. You know, super imperative to uh, to set correctly. So you want to set anything that you want to include in scope um, and exclude in scope. So if there's certain endpoints that you don't want to, to be testing, then you can uh, exclude them here via regex. And um, so we're just going to simply do that for now. Um, what's up here in the site tree is you can actually hide everything except for what you set in scope. So if you do that, then you're you're just going to hide everything here. You can still see it if if you um, uh, unselected that. So here you have here, and you can search through the site tree here, and you can see all the requests that it's made. So you can see the, and if you change here to the request and response, um, you can see all those requests and response here. I'm also going to change one thing that I like here just for preference is I like to see the request and response panel side by side. So I can also see the, re the request and the response. And then on the worker menu, you also have some other options you can you can add in and we'll get to some add-ons later. But if you do add add-on, sometimes they're going to be available in this worker space. Um, uh, and you can add them in here. So you can go to a few of these that they have. Same thing with down here. So this is the information bar. So what you have here is you have your history. Um, we can also, we can do two ways to filter this. We can filter just the site that it was selected. So if we just want this endpoint, we can select that. We can also, um, depending if you have multiple things in context. So a lot of times when you're security testing, you may security test you know, different uh, hosts, but they're all part of the same assessment. Then you can you can filter you know to everything that's in scope, and you can see everything that's in scope. And then here, if you scroll down through here, you'll see that uh, they, that all those requests and responses that it made. 
So on this window here, you have uh, the history, you have a search, so you can you know search through um, any requests and responses. You have alerts. Um, these are anything that's been passively or actively generated, and we'll get to passive and, and active scanning. But basically, when you're navigating manually through a page, what Zap is doing is passively uh, looking for security vulnerabilities, and you'll get uh, you know, some pop-ups here that show you those alerts. Um, and the nice thing about these is that you can fully edit these. So if you, if you wanted to edit anything in here or delete them or change the risk, you can um, change any data, you know, depending on uh, what is important for your application. So if you say that cross-domain configuration is actually an informational risk or maybe it's a high risk, you can change some of those. Uh, you can also change these if, if you think that um, Zap found a false positive, then you can change these false positive or how well you think that um, Zap found these. You can also input your own, you know, and you know, and keep a record of some things you found manually that maybe you're not relying on the scanner to actually find for you. Uh, then you have your output tab. So when you, sometimes you'll have um, different alerts from different extensions or or from itself. You have web sockets here, so you can see your web socket traffic as well. Um, and if you click at that uh, green plus plus mark. I should show you more of the output here. But... Okay. So from here, we're going to we'll go back to the history um, tab. And one thing that that you want to always do is is in the in Zap itself, you can always right click on responses or or in the history here. But basically, you should right click on everything if there's anything you want to do. So a couple, you know, it, it'll always bring up a context menu and there and it's context aware and different things you can do um, uh, with these different requests and responses. Let's go back. Um, to Firefox. Um, one thing also you can do is basically you can um, break in and, and inspect a certain uh, application as it's going. So you can actually capture that. Basically, you can like kind of a debug the application where you can um, add a breakpoint and then capture uh, that data before it's actually sent to the server. So you can make changes on the fly um, when you're the calculation. So let's just go to search here. And we're going to set this up. how you turn on that you want to. Uh, uh, set a breakpoint. If you want to set a breakpoint on everything, you can set this mark right here. Um, and if you want to set it just on a certain request, um, if you go through the options here, and then there's just a ton of options. We, we'll, we'll touch on a few of these as we go through the, the tool itself. Um, but if you, uh, if you come in here and you go uh, down to breakpoints, Let's see where it's not actually. It also has a very nice um, search feature. So it'll search through here and it'll actually show you anything that um, that contains uh, breakpoints. So I, I believe it's in this um, checkbox here, and I'm actually not somebody's not able to select it. So move forward. But anyway, you, you can set the okay, I'm sorry, here add a add a custom breakpoint in the tools right here. So if you want to add a custom breakpoint, what you would do is you would actually put in here, you can do it as regex or just a string. So let's say you want to make sure that you breakpoint on anything that says um, slash search um, of JSP, like, like we saw there. Um, you could save that. And it'll actually also pop up a little window here that um, uh, that shows you which breakpoints. Um, that uh, that you have set, and and so now if you navigate to that page, if you navigate back to, you can navigate to any of the pages on the application itself, and, you, and you're not going to see that there's a breakpoint. But if you navigate back to the search, you're actually going to find this breakpoint. Um, one nice thing, if you're using the HUD, it'll actually pop up right in your browser, and if you're not using the HUD, it'll pop up right here. And then so this right. Here we can actually make any changes that we want and send this onto the server. So there's a few different options here. So you can just forward that one request, um, and then you just skip to the next, you know, manual response that happened, um, or you can submit and continue to the next breakpoint. Um, you know, depending if you have more set or you have this turned on. So let's go ahead and just change this to going to, you know, 
you know, search dash test, which probably should 404. And we'll go ahead and forward this on to the browser. And we'll go back to the browser. And you'll see here that we actually changed that in line that, you know, to, to change uh, where this message was going to. I'll go ahead and turn off this breakpoint. Or you can set it the other way, like I said, and you can set this on automatically. And then any request that you make uh, will have that breakpoint there. And same thing for the HUD in the browser is that is that you can make these requests on the fly to say, well, I would actually, instead of going home, let's send me actually to search and then forward that on. And should actually change it to the search. And, and this is a way to, um, uh, to navigate around, you know, any client side uh, protections that, that the application may have in place or just things that you, you would like to, um, you know, to change like post parameters and things like that, that you don't have to, you know, um, utilize the web debugger, you can kind of do that in line and look at the applications. So let's go back to the history here and let's actually, let's actually go back and search for something. And um, so let's just search for test. Okay, so you can filter these by the different requests that you have. These IDs here, if you find like jumping IDs that are probably because other requests that you haven't had filtered out, um, and that's why you're seeing a big jump into, into these different ID numbers. But you see your, um, our query here for test. Um, so I do want to go over uh, just a couple uh, cool features of Zap. So one nice thing is you can actually do this. You can open and resend with the, with the request editor. Um, and basically that allows you a way to make modifications on the fly uh, to the application and see the result without actually replaying it in the browser. Um, which makes for testing, uh, you know, much faster. So let's say I wanted to find out if this, you know, you know, query could say Caleb, I would change that. And then I would see what it would say in the response. Let's go and look for Caleb. I figured that should work, but. Oh, sorry, that's the. Let's go to let's go or anyway you can and you can you can that so that sorry I'm sorry that was for home I don't know why that had the query screen there um, let's go back to search and look for search test that's probably because we, we we changed that around um, we go back to Firefox and we'll do a search rather and if you did a search for uh, testing. We should see that that's uh, you know coming up here in the source code. So let's go ahead and again we can um, open and resend with the request editor. And then if you make any modifications to this, so if you say you know Caleb, and you look at the response here, you'll see. And I'm just control I think for the find. You can see that that we're actually changing the route. We can actually view that modified uh, request and response. And also, it also is is also populating in the table, which which some proxies don't actually do that. They won't actually capture the data, which is nice. We can actually see that data come through the history. Um, so what this is really good for is if you wanted to iterate and see, you know, is this vulnerable for cross site scripting? You know, you could put something like this in here, right? And see, you know, is that coming around the other side unfiltered? And was I able to do any cross site scripting? You'll see here, um, you know, you see that, that they have the syntax highlighting that we are able to add a script tag, uh, you know, with some JavaScript here. And if we really want to um, uh, to verify that, you can right click here and then, you know, open URL and browser. So let's go ahead and have it open up in Firefox. And you should see here, you see um, the JavaScript, uh, you know, popping up and alert here. Element here. You should see that a JavaScript that we injected. Anybody have any questions before we keep going? Nigel Horn had a question. It says, um, 
no, 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 no. Is there a CLI that I can add as Git hook to test a site when I Git commit before publishing it? Yeah, no, and I'm glad you brought that up. Yes. Uh, so this is kind of like how the manual uh, tester would, would utilize that. But actually, there is, um, you know, a ton of functionality that Zap has. You're able to deploy this as um, a GitHub Action or as a, um, a Jenkins plugin. Um, it also has Zap Docker images. And yes, you actually have, and we can we can take a, a second to, to check this out. So um, Zap actually does have a robust, and uh, we're going to the API too, so maybe that's a, a good time to, to stop and look at some of the automation capabilities of Zap. So Zap has a robust uh, command line. So you can actually do a, a good majority of the things you can do in here, minus some of the manual checks um, through the command line. So you could you know, start sessions here, you know, change a lot of your options. You can actually, you know, a good option here is you if you like just the HUD, you can actually just start this, start Zap up a daemon mode. Um, and that's probably what, you know, what most of the Docker images are doing and run the HUD. And then you don't even have Zap at all really running, um, you know, as an application, you're just going to, you know, utilize the, the HUD, which we'll go through. Um, but yeah, you can scan, you can do add-ons, you can um, spider. So there are a lot of different things you can do with, with the, the command line. So as well as, and I guess we'll, we can get into that, but there's also a, a um, and if you go to the website, they'll have the documentation on how to set that up as a, as a, a GitHub action. Um, but if you go to HTTP, uh, if you're proxying, um, then you'll actually have this local API and what, this is really nice because you can actually, if you had this running on a server somewhere, you can interact with it from an API. So, and you can pretty much do a majority of the things that, that you can do with the application itself. So, um, uh, you know, from this API. So if you wanted to scan or spider your application, uh, you can do that directly from the API. So if you wanted to spider, and we can actually do that. Uh, if you want to see, we, we can do it both ways. But if you wanted to spider an application here, um, you would just, you know, go to, and obviously you wouldn't go to this, but this is a good way of actually testing uh, that your, um, uh, that your, what, what endpoints you're going to use. Um, and you can go to, to scan. And then, um, so it's going to, so it is going to ask you for an API key. You could, you could turn that off. So if you wanted to do that, you would go into um, your options here and, and go to API. And then here is your API key. So you can copy that. Um, or you can generate another one, or you can set your own, or you can disable it, or you can set it for you know non-safe applications that you know read-only kind of applications don't require it. Um, and then if you want to go ahead and put the URL in, so let's go ahead and do the budget store. Um, and then if you're gonna go ahead and hit scan here, we, we won't worry about any of these things. Um, this will show you how to do it from an automated perspective. So if you hit scan, um, and it should scan the bot store. And you see here that it's going ahead and, and scan um, the store here. Um, it will also, you'll see that these things are marked out of scope, which means, you know, it's only anything that's in scope. Let's go ahead and pause that. These scans and spiders that you do on the, um, in the application side is if you wanted to go ahead and you could, you could click um, and let's see here. I'm sorry. And it goes, and it goes by and it turns, um, the application. So with that, you, you see these uh, these here. Um, that just tells you that the endpoint wasn't found manually. It was actually found through those apply so without the spider. That means that you found it manually, and all these other things that we didn't actually browse to manually was found via the spider. Um, and then you know if you, if you have to do that request here, you, so here's you know the get request that you would have to put. And you know to, to do that scan. Uh, so they also have the API in several different languages. So no get on go, uh, no get across to PHP. 
Uh, they already have a library set up with all some of these functions uh, already made for you. One cool thing about the API libraries is they're actually tied back to the core application. So if they make a change, that um, API library code is actually automatically generated. So you're already always going to be up to date with um, uh, the feature set of the API if you're using the most recent version. So that answers uh, the question. Um, since we're on Spider here, we can go ahead and do this. There's a few different things here when you attack. So you can do Spider, the Active Scan, but you can actually use an Ajax Spider. So a lot of applications now, you know, are, are running modern applications that maybe use an Ajax and JavaScript um, fetch commands to, uh, to navigate through the site. And where a traditional Spider parses the source code, looks for reference links and, and follows them down, where an Ajax Spider will actually click on the page itself. Um, so we can actually do that if we want to the budget. Um, you know what? Before we do that, just because it's be a visual uh, representation, we can go to um, the plugins. So there's an, a um, substantial amount of plugins that are installed with Zap itself. Um, and so you can go through here. There's also a workplace um, that you can check for updates on, and you can download these applications. You can also download them from, you know, uh, uh, third parties also put um, different plugins on there. We can go through how to do that, but they, but it actually has a, a, a very awesome um, Gradle plugin uh, if you're going to use uh, Java or Kotlin um, that you know pulls in all your dependencies uh, and also will package this up into a .dot file for you. And, and it's actually um, you know pretty easy if you want to either add on to the API itself, which which I think is fantastic, or if you want to extend the capabilities of of Zap, um, you can do that. So the other way you can extend onto it is by scripts. So I'm going to go ahead and download something from the marketplace called Community Scripts. Uh, I may have actually installed. So let's see. So you have here you have your Community Scripts. Install that. And then I'm going to go to the marketplace and install them. So if you wanted to install anything, then you would um, you know click here, you know select which one you want to install, and then install selected. And it's going to go and um, install it for us. Um, and what that'll actually give you here is it'll actually give you this this scripts um, uh, window, which and they'll actually should you this here your script console. So what this gives you a lot of community driven scripts. These these scripts can be written and um, most commonly in JavaScript and that's But I think it's anything that follows this this JavaScript. Um, uh, um, Uh, it, 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 whatever follows this this uh, kind of procedure of, of so I think you can also do it in Kotlin um, and, in, and in Python I think it's developing these scripts but the majority of these scripts are written in JavaScript or Zest Zest is a graphical language that was developed by, by Mozilla uh, Mozilla has a, a, a uses Zap um, the the um, the team lead and creator uh, of the application also works from Mozilla um, so here you have all these different rules that you can do. And uh, just and you can go and read through these, um, and you can inspect the scripts. There also is a GitHub page that uh, has them all listed here, and you can kind of navigate through it that way. One thing I really like a lot is to drop requests non scope. So if I'm manually going through a page, I want it to go ahead and drop any request that's not set directly in my scope here. And you can see this here. So this is just written in JavaScript. So basically, what this is saying is, if the message is not in scope. Uh, you're going to go ahead and set this response body and response header. So let's go ahead and check that out here. Um, and let's just say we wanted to go to, you know, uh, we can just do a different port number. Oops, let's right. let's right. here. But actually, we have here. Actually, it'll drop that request and one of the requests onto that page, but it'll pop this up and say that why it's blocked. One nice thing about scripts is this is all on the fly. So let's say we wanted to change this to, you know, you know something like that, again, during demos. And then if we went back to that page on the fly, you're going to see that, that that's changed to you as you would for testing without reloading anything. Or anything, um, it, and it's pretty fantastic. So, with that, let's go ahead and go uh, try out the Ajax Spider here on Budget. 
So if you right clicked here and went to attack and went to the Ajax fighter, um, and we're going to go ahead and not do Firefox headless. Let's go ahead and do Firefox just so we can see, you know, um, how it's actually interacting here. And we can actually set some of these user things. Um, um, and we can, we can, I'll show you that um, as we go forward. And I know I'm probably, um, hopefully we have enough time to go through some of this. So you're going to see here, it's actually going to pop up uh, Firefox here. Um, you can see that it's flagging things out of scope, which is not really going to it. And it's actually clicking around as it's going through the page here um, and clicking on all the links and doing all the functionality. So I'm going to head and close this. Um, yeah. And one thing to do when you're scanning or spidering, you're going to have these pop ups here that show you the, um, uh, the status. You also have them down here that'll show you what's being actually spidered. Um, this little toolbar here, which will kind of give you a, that you know that you're spidering one site. Like I said, let's go ahead and, and um, get rid of a lot of these Firefox windows. So let's go ahead and close it. That should stop the Ajax spider that's currently happening. And we'll go back to, to doing things manually. So with with active and passively scanning, there's there's a lot of um, I know we've been over that briefly. We can all, you can also do that from the HUD. Um, there are a lot of options that you can select here too. So if you wanted to um, change on how the passive scanning rules are, is you can change some of these to to make sure that what it looks for, what it doesn't look for, and the same thing for active. There's a lot of options here with um, uh, passive scanning and active scanning. So you can really tune this to, to, to what you would like to scan. So you can do how many hosts scan currently, you know, what are the threads? You can actually set, you know, cause scanning and spidering could take a long time. You could set this to, you know, how long do I would like, you know, uh, a certain rule to go and before I move on to the next one, how long would I like the whole scan to take? So if I wanted to have it scan, it take 10 minutes. Um, you know, how, what's delay in there, you know, because basically, you know, sometimes when you're spidering and actively scanning things and you've set, you know, these up really high, it could actually take like a site down. You can also, you know, verify what kind of injections that you want to do. What, where is that going to put malicious data in to look for um, vulnerabilities? And you can select those here. And a lot of that stuff will just, you know, will just slow down your scan and spider time. And same thing for the the expired. You can kind of set, you know, um, you know, similar options here. Anybody kind of have questions on on um, scanning or spidering? Okay, um, and then so yeah, so you and you also when you when you spend a spider, you're also going to see that these alerts are are coming up here um, as well. These will these will start getting um, filtered down as you, uh, you know, as it either passively or actively scans. And I know we haven't done any active scanning yet, so we so we can do that. And the same same result will happen. It'll it'll just actively go through the application, you know, put in vectors. And the same thing here, you can actually filter those filter alerts from uh, either what's in scope or the node you've actually selected at all. Um, and then, you know, and all that. So um, a couple features here as far as um, in Zap that I, in, that I really enjoy is, um, is the fuzzing. So everything in Zap is context aware. So you can do this manually, but you also, if you select um, you know, a certain parameter or something on the page, you can do a few different things. So one thing I really like is you can encode or decode. Um, so let's say you wanted to see like what this would be like encoded or decoded. If it was, you can see your basic for encoded, um, basic for URL encoded, URL encoded. Um, and you can be able to see it, you know, how this looks encoded or decoded. If you wanted to make a change that, that the web application is blocking, you know, certain text, you can encode or decode here. You have different um, options to encode or decode. So, so let's say you know if you had like a you know percent two, um, look at that decoded, and you and you can see that, that that's a um, you know quote mark. So you can also fuzz the application, um, and if you do the context aware, select that. But you can also select it itself and add if you wanted to do multiple locations. Um, and then you're if you went to the um, to the payloads here, you can put in what you want. So let's say we want to see, you know, how are they, um, how are they protecting against cross-site scripting? So we could say something like, 
let's put in test, uh, let's put in test with a quote, uh, let's put in test with a single quote, uh, you know, let's put in test with a with an angle bracket, let's do, you know, test with, uh, you know, an H1 bracket, you know, and then maybe you could even do, you know, if you want to go and, and find out if you can do any kind of JavaScript, you can do that. And then when you run this, it's actually going to, to automatically uh, go through and um, and make all those requests for you in this, you know, query location here. So we can go ahead and, and then I can show you where you can even find some, some good things to use for fuzzing. So let's go ahead and start the fuzzer. You'll see that, that this fuzzer popped up here and you'll see, I mean, obviously it's very quick that it made a lot of these um, requests for you. Again, it, this is all works kind of the same way inside this window. So, so as you're selecting these requests, you can see them in the page here. And actually what's nice, it actually shows you uh, because it was reflected, it actually is gonna highlight like where those changes were made. One nice thing I like about this as well is as if you, and I think you can do this pretty much anywhere, but let's say you wanted to look here and see um, at two applications, you wanted to see the difference between those two. Let's go back to the photo, that'll probably make it easier. But you can select two, um, two uh, requests here from the history or from one of the context menus in the, um, in the information bar. And you can actually compare two requests. So let's say you want to compare those requests, and it'll show you the diff of where the changes were made. Um, or you can, you know, compare um, compare two responses. Same way, it'll show you where the diff is here. So it's very useful if you know it, it, when you're doing uh, things like that to see you know what actual changes were made if you can't verify that. Uh, a lot of times, what you look at is you look at the response body and see how that's changed, and that's how you know a change has been made. But it's it's sometimes it's hard. Uh, you know, via the naked eye to, to see where those changes have actually taken place. Um, another quick um, thing you can do, so you can also, if you wanted to utilize another proxy, you know, search at Burp Suite or Fiddler or Charles, um, you can actually set it to, uh, to do an upstream proxy and you can set that here and then you can upstream all that and chain proxies together. Um, you know, to get the, you know, get the full effect, or maybe you're, you know, you're used to doing your functional testing in Charles, but you want to do some of your security testing or at least see, you know, some of that traffic, you can, you can chain those together and utilize those, those proxies. Just kind of nice. Um, and there's also a replacing option. What, what, and, and actually one good thing about the help here is it actually has a context help menu. So let's say I wanted to find out like what the replacer options are, replace text. Um, um, it, should show, it should show you diff different help based on your context and, and, uh, and different things you can do here. Let's see. So, so, um, So let's go back to the budget application. And and does anybody stop me if they have any questions? And um, so we just have to load up. So we'll, we'll go through the HUD a little bit too. Um, so this is the HUD. So it, it has its own context. So you can set things that you want to in context. So let's go ahead and set this in uh, in scope. And then it'll show you what's in scope on this page. Um, this will, same thing as the break up here. So you can set that in the browser itself and then you know navigate to a page um, and you're gonna have that break. Um, a break. Uh, this is this is nice. This will show you if there's any fields that are disabled, and it'll actually show and enable those fields that are disabled for you, so you can get around any client side protections. Uh, this shows you any page alerts that have popped up, kind of as you're passively scanning, and then you can select those, and you can actually look through those, and it'll show you the uh, request and response um, and any information on that actual um, alert that's happening. Um, so that's on the left hand side. 
Um, you can also add a few things to either side usually. Um, and then you can add it here and add comments. So if you had comments on this page, didn't have any comments. Oh, here we go. So here's one comment, and it actually shows you this little this little exclamation point tells you that that this may be a sensitive comment. So you can actually uh, just highlight over here and actually show you um, that there's a comment here, and basically that's the admin page um, here that's been commented. So most likely, if I you know because it's a vulnerable application, if I went in here and um, uncommented that. Or I just navigated to, I guess easier. I was, if I just navigated to admin JSP, I'll actually see that I'm able to go into the page even if I haven't logged into the application because I found that that, that what they're using for, um, uh, you know, for authorization is that they're commenting that out if I'm not an admin. Um, from here is you actually have this is so this is more for your page itself. This is more for your global kind of view here. So you have your sites tree just like I showed before. If you wanted to see, um, you know, let's go to localhost here and you can you know see your sites tree here and any of your app, any of your requests and responses um, and then here you could actually start any of your spiders um, interactive scans and your ajax spiders um, you can change your attack mode and then it also shows you what the alerts are on on the site itself so um, on the site you know you see here that you have three lows here but on the page you only have one this is for the whole entire site you're going to see all the alerts that are popping up and you can also toggle scripts. So if, if I have some scripts that are downloaded here, and actually since I since I pulled in all of them, you can actually enable these or disable these. So you can see what kind of scripts you can do if you wanted to and, and, uh, emulate iOS or IE or different browsers. Um, you know, and you can drop requests not in scope. So if I turn that off and on, you can turn you can actually toggle them through here and enable them and disable them without actually going back to the application. And then uh, same thing here. You can see all your requests that you're making in your history, and you can filter through those. So, um, so, so also what uh, Zap can do for you is, is after you've scanned it, you can actually um, get a an HTML report of the um, of the alerts that I found. So you can generate a, an HTML report or an XML report or JSON report. You can also do this via the API um, and and also the command line. So if you generated an HTML report, and we'll go ahead and throw this actually in, we'll do this in downloads and save it and if we open this up for us or you can export all your applications here Okay, so we load that up. Um, you'll see you'll get a, a nice alert uh, um, summary page here um, that'll have all your alerts and information on there. And you can actually customize this as well, so you can decide how much information you want to provide in this report. Uh, a nice thing as well is if you want like a JSON file or something like that to ingest into some other reporting mechanism, you can do that. And you can, like I said, you can also do that through the API itself. Um, So I think the, the one thing we'll look at is just how does um, Zap do authentication? Like, let's say if you want an authenticated scan, um, there's certain ways to do this. So depending on your your um, uh, authentication uh, mechanism. So I believe that actually, if you looked in here under authentication, um, there's actually uh, a script here that can do some different authentication types. Um, and then you can enable those. You probably have to, I'm sure you can read through the help and you might have to make some changes to what your exact, exact um, user would be, but I do want to show how some of the built-in um, authentication works with the Zap. So again, let's go ahead and go back to um, back to budget and what you do is to log in. So I, I already previously registered, so I'm going to go ahead and log in with my account. My super secret password. So 
actually, I need to register. Um, so let's go ahead and register. And so it's going to pull that out in my super secret password. And then I'm actually going to go ahead and log out and then log back in. Uh, enter in those credentials that I supplied when I registered. And then look for that request that had that um, that login on in here. So we'll go over here, and here's uh, the login request that you're going to see. And if you right click on the um, on the history, you can actually flag as context. So let's go ahead and flag it as um, as form based authentication. So let's go ahead and do that. And then this will pop in here, and actually going to create a new context for you. And you see you have these different contexts. You have your default context that you can use. You have your HUD context. That's your context you're using from the HUD itself. And then it's going to create a new context based on the application that you're authenticating to. And it's going to actually take all this information. You can do this manually, of course, um, but it's going to take your username and password. Um, it, it didn't know which one was the parameter here. So we go ahead and select username and do the password as password. And then you can also set the regex here so you can look at like what looks like a logged in response versus a logged out response. And um, and so we can go ahead and do and do that. So let's let's go ahead and look at what it looks like when you uh, have an unauthenticated request to home um, or to or to budget itself. Um, you have guest user here. So now let's see if I go to the application um, as a user, uh, we should see that. Um, that I have actually my um, username here. So we can just do we can do that as my username. And we go back to your budget context. You can you can just double click on your context here, and you can set in here that that you know what you're looking for your regex here. That that what's a user? So guest would be a non-authenticated user, and then whatever username you have um, would be that it's a um, and, you, and probably shouldn't use it for user. You probably look for something else on here, um, or even just something that changed um, uh, because as you'll see here, you can actually add in users. So it's going to go ahead and, and add in a user for me um, here with my information. And my password, um, and I have a user there. And then I also have something called forced user. So, and then I can select. Sorry, so let me enable that user. And you can put in all your users ahead of time, and it'll know to switch to a certain user for authentication. Um, and then you can set your forced user here. Change your session management. So you have some selections here. So depending on what what all uh, session management your application is having, so this is cookie based. So we're going to do that. Um, and then you can set like what would, what would be your status code or anything like that. If you really wanted to know like who, when you were logged into the application. Let's go ahead and enter that in. So now if I go up to Budget itself and I go ahead and say open um, URL in browser, you'll see here the actually login to guest user. And I'll tell you why, we also have to do to also enable this um, forced user mode and that will force it to log into whatever user you selected. And now if I go and I say, um, open user URL and browser. And should work that it log you as, um, as a user. So it's using that authentication and doing the authentication. So now if you find scanning it as an authenticated user, so we can go ahead and do that too. So let's go ahead and attack it. We haven't done this yet. And we'll go ahead and do um, you know an active scan. From there, and you're gonna you know come up here. You can talk, change your policies around if you've added any in there. Change whatever context you want to use, and you can also select your user. So I wanted to go ahead and scan authenticated, and here's my user. Um, and then if you wanted to show any advanced options, so you can filter de depending on what you you know don't want to be included in the scanning, uh, different input um, things. You can do this per context or per scan instead of just setting the overall um, and it, um, overall options. And then technology. So you know if you want to. If you know some of this information, this will obviously help the scanner to know that to don't do any, um, you know, payloads that that don't matter because of, you know, that, that these just don't, it, you know, it's not going to target like a PHP site if it's not running PHP. And your policies here, so you can change some of your policies around and change what you would actually like to do. We'll go ahead and keep it as the default. And then we can go ahead and start the scan. You know, make sure that your your scope is set correctly. And it's going to go through now and start scanning that application. I'm here and show you what your alerts are. If you look down here at the bottom. You what page it's looking at, what um, you know, what, what it's actively scanning, 
from there. And then if you your alerts, you should see that these are you know increasing um, as it goes through and scans through there. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop it because it could take a uh, whole scan. And again, if we, if we went and export the, the HTML report, um, uh, you have, to have that information um, and there that change. So and the same thing here. So when you go to authentication, you could do you could do manual, um, and you could do script based or JSON, or you know, if you want to do uh, you know basic auth or anti them all. You can actually set it up here. You don't actually have to select that. It just makes it a little easier. It'll, it'll pull that information out for you. Okay, so um, I, I think um, there's, there's a lot of options to go over with Zap that I don't know if we would have the time to get to, but uh, what I really recommend is, is you know, going through the application. Uh, there is a, a great help, so if you click the help and you clicked on the user guide, um, and it's some excellent help documentation, you know, just walk you through how um, you started, and then also, you know, the interface here. Um, and I think finally, what I would go over is just the the add-ons here is that so so when you're doing some of those scans, some add-ons can be that they add different functionality to the site, and some add-ons can be that they actually um, um, that they actually change the way it scans um, the application. So you can actually add if you want here to scan, you can actually you know add on data or alpha rules that aren't added to the default rules if you want to you know have more robust scanning ability. Um, and then just just one um, kind of self promoter is this is an extension that I'm working on myself. And obviously, if anyone wants to go with me and, and kind of go through how to create an add-on for Zap, um, is here. So let's go ahead and install that. It's already installed. And then for some reason, my bar is not working, so I can't actually add it in here. Um, but if you were, you you can see that what basically what it does is it pops up and shows you which which applications uh, which. Uh, responses have query parameters that are reflected, and then um, you can do some analysis through there. So I'll hopefully have a better demo for that. Um, so one thing I did do is I did upgrade my Java um, right before this uh, talk was probably the best idea. So that may have been what's causing this uh, this button to add on any page. But but as you can see here, you know, not really a necessity. Um, it's going to um, um, it it'll go ahead and uh, uh, and as you use the application, it'll pop up the relevant for you as you're scanning it. And then you can select too. So if you had a different scan, you could it would it would show you here. Um, and then uh, just 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 to kind of back to the it is if you interacted with that API if you wanted to look at you know, scans app, uh, go to you know, active scan and then under view you can actually you know, now, put in if you know your scan um, oh, And view and good view. Uh, the study show you, you know, um, uh, you know how many alerts I should have. And so you can also, you know, maybe you think you'd like. Um, and you can also look at after getting something, you could actually start pulling the status, you know, um, and get a good status like where you are. Even if this was running on the server somewhere, um, and you're interacting it with it that way, and it's extremely uh, powerful from that. And as well, you have this running as something that you use all the time. You can go to the alert, and you can even look at all the alerts based on the um, you know, summary. Um, and it should give you. We'll go ahead and just do. It should give me like the alert summary. Of, um, of all the alerts that, that we occurred when we did the symbol scanning um, and splattering. So you see we found one high, uh, 42 low, 23 medium, with your Michelin, and then you can get your, you can get details as well. And you can change this if you want it in JSON or HTML or XML, um, however you'd like to report. Another thing is, so if we go down to the alert section, you can see that we have this cross-site scripting reflected here. So that's the um, the alert that it picked up on its own. So it actually found this 
for us without us. We, even though we found it manually, it actually found it for us. And it's going to show you exactly where that is. Um, you know, and it'll give you some right up here as well. And you can also, like I said, so one, you know, one thing you want to make sure that this is a valid um, um, a vulnerability is you could go ahead and just open it up in Firefox and see, are you going to get that, you know, uh, that way to pop up? Here, that you're getting that, uh, you know, alert one. I mean, there's probably a ton of more things I can go over, um, but I definitely want to open up anyway. Have any questions, or if anyone wants to see anything uh, differently, because I know I went over it very quickly. Hopefully, it's still with me. Yeah, so there's not enough time to go into everything. Um, and my experience with proxies are very, very limited. But um, I can tell just by looking at these options that a lot of um, things that I had wanted to see on the burp suite were blacked out on the burp suite, but are available on here as free. Uh, so that's pretty cool. And I can't wait to mess around with it some more. Yeah, so that's that's a good call out here. Is that is that um, Burp Suite is an amazing tool, um, but it does have a limited version in their free version. Uh, whereas Zap doesn't have any difference between a pro version or a free version. All this capability is available to you. And um, uh, I've been primarily a Burp user for the last few years, and I slowly went over to Zap, and and even more so getting ready for, for the talk. And you know, things that I thought missing from Burp. Um, you know, that, were, that I did not think Zap had a capability. Um, I quickly found that the Zap had something similar. It was just maybe, um, you know, name something different or, or had different functionality. But I don't know if I really saw, or if I could sit here and tell you um, that if there were anything that um, the Zap is, is absolutely missing that, that are in other proxies. And the extendability is just, uh, you know, out of this world compared to, to I think, any other products. Like I said, I know, and I know that was a you know kind of fast and furious introduction to this. Um, there is a great series by the creator of Zap uh, called Zap in Ten, which he goes through like each of these in ten minute chunks, which are pretty easy to, to digest. And I'll make sure that I that I give you um, you know, all the resources to that. And there's other talks as well. So if you're a Burp user, there's actually a talk out there that tells you like, okay, how do you use Zap from a Burp user's perspective, um, and what what kind of tricks you can do to make Zap you know, more Burpy if that's what you're used to. Okay, great. I don't know if anybody has anything else, or I mean, I can obviously uh, show more if anybody's interested. But uh, but I know we're probably uh, pressing on time for the two. Yeah, I think the meeting's scheduled to run until noon. But this is great. Thank you so much. Yeah. I mean, I said, uh, Caleb, when you use this, yeah, tool, please, yeah, and honestly, I can always be here till. Yeah, just quick question: When you use this, sorry, tool, I cut you off, Mark. Uh, this is actually Rich. When you use this tool, is there any sort of chain of trust? Like, is, does Zap sign their distribute uh, distributions, or do you build it yourself? What's the typical approach to validating the tool to bring yeah, perfect encrypted uh, environments? Yeah, no, for example, so, so the cert that it generates, uh, and that's one of the hard parts. If you, I, I actually tried to like build my own proxy, and that's one of the harder parts I think to implement, is it actually uh, dynamically generates that SSL cert. So this SSL cert is bound to this actual instance of, of that. So even if you trust the SSL cert, you're not trusting like every other user using that. Uh, uh, you know, so, so yeah, so here when you generate, and I, I don't know if that was a question per se, but. Uh, when you want to trust that cert, um, you can regenerate the and it does have like an extra but dynamically generated for this instance. So then a follow-up question. Any popular websites had vulnerabilities this discovered? Is there any like good uh, reports or media or anything that Zap helped uncover some issues? 
Sure. I don't know if anything's really published exactly, but but I would say so. Are now and, and obviously you can I guess ask me any kind of web application um, uh, as well. But here, it's a website called, called um, Hacker One, and it's a bug bounty program. I'm not sure how to program. Um, but they have they um, they kind of crowdsource. Um, uh, uh, basically, penetration tests. Remember, there's, a, there's two big sites called Hacker One, and there's also another one called Bugcrowd. And Hacker One actually has something called the Hacktivity, and you can go through and big companies can expose vulnerabilities like the A forum, how the person found it, what their right was, and you can go through and see. So here, as you can see, all of these uh, person provided that have either been paid out, um, and, and then if you actually it would actually show you like um, pressure down and, itself and, and kind of what they've been doing about it. It's tough figuring out what's important to you know different companies when you're finish this, you know. But I don't know for for instance if they use something like Burp or Zap. Um, but I would say that most people who are doing penetration testing, manual penetration testing, are, are using at least Burp or Zap or, or Charles or, or some other proxy um, to do that. And I think that's what the difference is. So, you know, it, it, it's a different realm of application testing where a lot of application testing is either like source code review or doing, um, you know, assessments with like a, a big scanner. This is geared, they does have some scanning and it's greatly customizable. But these tools are really geared toward the manual penetration tester to be sitting there in between the application. Doesn't mean it has to be there, but but I think that's where it's really geared and where the functionality really uh, Yeah, I don't know if you know if there's developers on this call too, if they see this put in their workflow, but it's definitely, you know, if, if I would love to hear uh, Nigel. Um, if he ever got that git hook to work, um, that would be awesome. I'd, I would love to walk through that. I'm not really that, that level of developer to, to do that, but I know you can do that in his app. And I believe they even have a blog post on like that, you know, you know, set that up and run. But yeah, and like I said, uh, if anybody wants to get, get with me after this, uh, we can always run through like, you know, how do you extend it? Uh, uh, you know, another edge it. case, I'm always available to walk through any of those. And even if you have an application that you'd like to walk through with me, that, you know, please let, let me know. We can always work through it and, and test it as long as you have authorization to test that application. <laughs> 